Um, I see we are a bit running out of time. Actually, I still have quite a few interesting quotes prepared. Uh, I think uh, maybe we will just continue uh, for a while and uh, the video will be anyway be recorded. So if you have something to do, uh, you can continue watching afterwards. Uh, it will be remaining anyway on Facebook or YouTube. Uh, so that's fine. Uh, but I think I have still a few interesting points that you think are very re relevant and related to this topic. So if you're interested, uh, please bear with me. Uh, it's probably another uh, 20 minutes, half an hour uh, that we, until we come to the end of our summary about stream entry and the potential of stream entry. And in that course, in this uh, direction, we also should take a look at what do the, actually the Sutta says, say about what are the qualities of a Sutta Panna. And I, I will read out to you a few quotes now, just one after another. The first one comes from Anguttara Nikaya 4.88. With the utter destruction of three fetters, Epiku is a stream enterer, no longer subject to rebirth in the lower world fixed in destiny, heading for enlightenment. I think that we have covered roughly already. Maybe the only new thing here is that he's fixed in destiny. Oh no, we spoke about it also. Yeah. It's like a point of no return. The stream will carry him forward. So no need to worry. Uh, the momentum of the Dhamma will carry him towards Nibbana. Another Sutta. He falls into offenses. He falls into offenses in regard to the lesser and minor training rules. Like even he's a monk, we have some more heavy rules and serious ones, and then some smaller minor rules as well. So in these rules, he can commit offenses and fall from time to time. And he rehabilitates himself. For what reason? Because I have not said that he's incapable of this. But in regard to those training rules that are fundamental to the spiritual life, in conformity with the spiritual life, to the holy life, his behavior is constant and steadfast. Having undertaken the training rules, he trains in them. So that is also a possibility that a stream enter may from time to time break some of the smaller winner rules, but not those that are essential to the holy life, like the vow of celibacy. Uh, this is not something that a stream manager would throw overboard. Or his livelihood will also be pure. He will not engage in trades and selling and buying or giving out lottery numbers or reading balm for donations. Uh, this kind of livelihood uh, a stream manager would not engage in. Okay. Another one. As long as a bhikkhu is still not accomplished in faith, a sense of shame, hiri, moral dread, energy and wisdom, in cultivating wholesome states, I must still look after him. That's what the Buddha says. Huh? So somebody who is not yet accomplished in these things, uh, shame and fear of wrongdoing, wisdom, energy, the Buddha must still look after him. But when that monk is accomplished in faith, a sense of shame, moral dread, energy and wisdom in cultivating wholesome states, then I am unconcerned about him, thinking the bhikkhu can now look after himself. He won't be heedless. I like this. You can see a bit the independence that comes with stream entry, because the path is with you. You have not yet cultivated the path and walked it all the way to the end, but you know the path and there can be uh, some uh, junctions where you may still benefit from the help of others, but uh, basically he will not get lost. Within seven lifetimes at most, uh, he will reach the destination. So the Buddha says, he doesn't have to worry about that kind of person. He will find the path. Mm. Then, when householder, these five fearful, fearful 
animosities have subsided in a noble disciple. We spoke about it earlier, that refers to the five precepts. And he possesses these four factors of stream entry, which is faith in the Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha, and the virtue dear to the noble ones. And he has clearly seen and thoroughly penetrated with wisdom this noble method. Earlier in the same sutta, it was referred to dependent origination. So the stream enterer has also thoroughly penetrated with wisdom dependent origination. So such a person who has all these qualities, if he wishes, he could by himself declare of himself, I am one who is finished with hell, with the animal realm, hungry ghosts, or the plane of misery. I am a stream enterer. Samyutta Nikaya 12.41 So we see here also that the stream enterer has a uh, understanding of the law of cause and effect, dependent origination. So that's also one very important factor. Then in Narasutta he said that a stream enterer, he dwells at home with a mind devoid of disdain of stinginess, freely generous, open-handed, delighting in relinquishment and devoted to charity, delighted in giving, delighting in giving and sharing. So this is also one of the qualities of a stream enterer, uh, is of generous nature. So uh, this is some aspects from the suttas, and there's a lot of repetition, but these are uh, the cornerstones of stream entry how one can verify for oneself whether one has reached that state already or not. There's a one saying or uh, one quite interesting aspect about this, whether a Sotapanna has seen or experienced Nibbana. And this is also a bit of a matter of controversy. Uh, there's one case, for example, in the Vineyard Acts, in Mahavaga 1, uh, 23.6, where Venerable Sariputta and Mahamogalana, uh, they make a pact before they become monks. So it's actually before they become monks with the Buddha, they knew each other already, and they made a pact that they would inform each other if one among them reaches awakening. Then, after Sariputta has become a stream enderer, he then went to inform Mahamogalana who immediately recognized that when Hrusari Buddha has changed and, and straight away asked him whether he has attained the deathless. He asked Sari Buddha whether he has attained the deathless. Amatang Atikato. Amata, the deathless. Which Sari Buddha confirms. So this may seem to suggest that a stream enderer has, it doesn't say seen the deathless or experienced, but uh, he went to the deathless or attained the deathless. So it doesn't say that he has experienced Nibbana. It would simply mean that he has you know, Nibbana as his fixed destiny. And in this way, he has found and obtained the deathless. Yeah. So he's not yet there completely, but uh, he has attained to the deathless, there's a point of no return. So, in that sense, yes. Then among the benefits for stream entry, there is uh, the one sutta that says that one comes to possess knowledge not shared by others. Uh, I take this to mean that it's the knowledge of the path leading to the ending of suffering. Also, one has clearly seen causation and what has clearly seen causally arisen phenomena. So a stream enter also understands cause effect, cause and effect, dependent origination. Um, this is according to Anguttara Nikaya 6.97. So what is missing here, you see, he says he has knowledge and he has seen, not Nibbana, he has seen causation and has clearly seen causally arisen phenomena. Mm. And this is often what actually the stream enterers explain or proclaim after their attainment, 
whatever is of the nature to arising is also of the nature to cease. So there's a nature, uh, there's an understanding of conditionality. So this is what the steam enterer has seen, has understood. So nothing mentioned here again about seeing Nibbana. He has seen causation. Then another related discourse. Um, probably you know about the story from King Achata Sattu, um, famous king, uh, the Buddha's time. And the Buddha, at one time, he gave this King Ajata Sattu a discourse. And we have to know his personal story because he had actually killed his own father, King Bimbisara. So Ajata Sattu had murdered his own father in order to get to the throne. Then at some later point, uh, he had a conversation with the Buddha. The Buddha gave him a Dhamma talk. So then after the Dhamma talk was over and King Ajata Sattu had left, uh, the Buddha said to the monks, this king, because has ruined himself. He has injured himself. Because if this king had not taken the life of his father, a righteous man and a righteous king, then in this very seed there would have arisen in him the dust-free, stainless eye of Dhamma, the Dhamma Jaku. So he said he would have become a stream enterer, basically. Tiganikaya number two. But again, what has arisen in him? The eye of Dhamma. It's the Dhamma that he would have understood and penetrated. And it does not say he had a vision of Nibbana or glimpse of Nibbana. No, the eye of the Dhamma has arisen in him, would have arisen in him. Again, nothing mentioned about seeing Nibbana or experiencing it for the stream enterer. There's another sutta. Just as a clean cloth with all stains have been removed, that receives the dye, the color, very well. You know, if you want to dye your clothes and put color in, uh, it's helpful if it's not dirty or stained or oily and greasy. So you have to wash it first, and then you can dye it, and then it takes and absorbs the color perfectly. So in Prince Kanda and Tissa, uh, as they sat there, there arose the pure and spotless Tamai, Tamai, the Tamajaku. And they knew whatever things have an origin must come to cessation. And they, having seen, attained, experienced, and penetrated that Dhamma, having passed beyond doubt, having gained perfect confidence in the teacher's doctrine without relying on others. Tiganikaya 14. So again, what has arisen in them is the spotless Tamma eye. And what have they, what did they know? Whatever things have an origin must also cease. Hmm. So again, nothing about seeing Nibbana, but the eye of the Dhamma, having understood the Dhamma, uh, maybe by implication you can also say the Noble Eightfold Path, the way leading to Nibbana, that has a reason. And then I think the last one here, which I find the most interesting, uh, there's an exchange between two monks. And the one is uh, called Narada. And one monk asks this Narada, apart from faith, because he was a very developed meditator and probably already some form of Arya. He asked this Venerable Narada, apart from faith, apart from personal preference, apart from oral tradition or reasoned reflection, or from acceptance of a view after pondering it, does the Venerable Narada have personal knowledge? Thus, Nibbana is the cessation of existence or of becoming. Pavanitro, Pavanirodha. Does, he asked him whether Narada has personal experience about Nibbana being the cessation of existence. Then he answers, friend Savita, apart from faith and all the others, I know this, I see this. Nibbana is the cessation of suffering. And then 
The other one says to him, Then the Venerable Narada is an Arahant, one whose stains have been destroyed. Huh? Then he answers, Friend, though I have clearly seen as it is with correct wisdom, Nibbana is the cessation of becoming, I am not an Arahant, one whose stains are destroyed. Oh. So even though he says he understands about Nibbana being the cessation of suffering, he denies that he has attained that state, that he has personally experienced that. He says he has seen it with wisdom, with Banya, but he's not an Arahant. So for both friends, he explains, there was a well along a desert road, but it had neither a rope nor a bucket. So you're going through the desert, you want water, there's a well, fantastic. <laughs> but how do you get the water out? Because there is no bucket and no rope to get it out. Then a man would come along, oppressed and afflicted by the heat, tired and thirsty. He would look down into the well and the knowledge would occur to him. There is water. But he would not be able to make bodily contact with it, right? You can see the water down there, and he is sure that there's water, but uh, it doesn't have contact with it. So do, friend, though I have clearly seen as it is with correct wisdom, Nibbana is the cessation of becoming, I am not an Arahant, one whose stains are destroyed. Samyutinikaya 12.68. So you see, there's a difference between seeing or understanding with wisdom and directly experiencing something. Uh, what is, is a bit of a body idiom. Kayena pusitva means touching with the body, having touched with the body. And this is a way of speaking. speaking. It means directly experiencing it as if you would have touched it. And it cannot be more direct. So he says he has not directly experienced Nibbana, but he still has seen it with wisdom. So what he saw is that Nibbana is the cessation of becoming, but he hadn't experienced it. So supposedly this was already an Anagami. If even an Anagami wasn't able to experience Nibbana Tatu, how much less would it be the case for stream enders? However, you know, the Bali commentary tradition uh, does maintain that all Aryas can attain their corresponding fruition attainment. It's called Palasamabhati, fruition attainment. So it means if you're Sotapanna, you can enter into the uh, stream entry fruition attainment at will, or the Sakadagami in his respective attainment, and so on. Again, uh, this term is unfortunately not found in the suttas, or this idea about fusion attainment. Some have also quoted Ankutra Nikaya 11.7, 11.7, not 7.11, you know, <laughs> Ankutra Nikaya 11.7, and to support also the comment or interpretation, let's see, because there a sutta says that, friend Sari Buddha, Sorry, Buddha, could a bhikkhu obtain such a state of concentration that he would not be percipient of earth in relation to earth? And then water in relation to water, fire, air, on anything that is seen, heard, sensed, cognized, reached, sought after, and examined by the mind, but he would still be percipient. So the question is, uh, but a person could perceive, have a perception that is not based on anything um, of the world, you can say, uh, not part of the four elements. Yet he has a perception. Then Sariputta answers, uh, he could friend Ananda, because Ananda and Sariputta are having this conversation. But how, friend Sariputta, could he obtain such a state of concentration? And then Sariputta explains, here, friend Ananda, Epicure is percipient thus. This is peaceful, this is sublime, that is, distilling of all activities. 
the relinquishment of all acquisitions, the destruction of craving, dispassion, cessation, nibbana. It is in this way, friend Ananda, that a bhikkhu could obtain such a state of concentration that he would not be percipient of earth in relation to earth, water, fire, air, and he would not be percipient of anything seen, heard, sensed through the senses, but he would still be percipient, a percipient of that what I have just mentioned. So on first glance, this sounds as if the person is experiencing the Nibbana element, the Nibbana Dhatu. But this is not necessarily so, because we can see the exactly same practice. This, this is peaceful, this is cessation, the Nibbana. Exactly the same passage is also undertaken by non-Arahans in Ankutra Nikaya 9.36. And this practice is actually called Upasama Nusati, recollection of bees. This is a theme or a topic of meditation that can be undertaken by Aryas and non-Aryas even. So even a Puducana can incline his mind by reflecting on the qualities of Nibbana, oh, the cessation of formations, oh, the putting down of the burden of the aggregates. So this is something that everybody can reflect and contemplate on. It does not require a Nibbana experience. So it has Nibbana as an object, but this is not the same as the fruition attainment uh, of the commentary tradition or or other traditions that maintain that uh, that there is a special uh, meditation that only Aryas can undertake. Okay. So, long story short, uh, if you don't have this special fruition attainment meditation practice, all hope is not lost. Uh, according to the suttas, uh, it's not so clear that this is even necessary or this is even a feature. So, we are getting close to the end of my presentation here. Uh, there's two small sub-questions left uh, that we can quickly cover. One is whether it is possible to overestimate one's attainments. Can you, can you believe that you have attained stream entry? And, but in reality, it's not. Now, on one occasion, uh, reading out from the Buddha, one occasion, a number of bhikkhus had declared final knowledge in the presence of the Blessed One thus. We understand. Birth is destroyed. The holy life has been lived. What had to be done has been done. There is no more coming to any state of being. So this is a stock phrase, how people would declare the Arahantship. When those bhikkhus, Sunakata, when they declared final knowledge in my presence, there were some bhikkhus who declared final knowledge rightly. And there were some who declared final knowledge because they overestimated themselves. Therein, when bhikkhus declare final knowledge rightly, their declaration is true. But when bhikkhus declare final knowledge because of overestimation, the Tathagata, the Buddha, thinks, I should teach them the Dhamma. <laughs> because obviously they are not yet there and they overestimate themselves. So the Buddha needs to correct that. And he thinks, I will go and teach them the Dhamma. Majjhima Nikaya 105. So clearly there is a possibility to overestimate oneself. And in fact, even the monks' rules and the rules for the monks and nuns it's the most serious offense to take or to make claims about superior human stage, states such as noble attainments, uh, being a Sotapanna, Sakatakami, or all the way to Arahanship, or even the jhanas, to make claims about these states which in reality one has not attained and one knows that one, if one knows that one has not attained it, uh, then you commit a very serious offense and you're already not a monk anymore from that moment onward. But there's no offense in case of overestimation. 
So there's an exception. If the monk really believes he is an arahant, but I really he is not, but he couldn't see any defilements, and then, and then he made this statement maybe to another monk uh, that he is an arahant now. Even if it's not true, but because he overestimated himself, it's not an offense. So it's clearly possible. And this actually can easily happen, especially when the samadhi is strong and the hindrances have been successfully suppressed for a long time. Like on a retreat or intensive meditation period, uh, there can be periods where you, for a long time you feel, actually, can't even recall the last time I had a, a thought of ill will or anger. And you do your contemplation about the nature, dukkha, anatta. Uh, so there's understanding, there's wisdom, there's clarity of mind. And no defilements to be seen far and wide. So a person may then at that point come to the conclusion, that's it, can't get any better. But then as time goes by, Hmm. Some situation can arise where maybe gets offered just the right food for lunch, which triggers his taste buds. Maybe just the current durian, the latest, the beginning of the durian season. For so long he was waiting and now he experiences the taste of the fantastic durian. Uh, then at that time uh, he notices, oh, an arahant? Would an arahant have sense desire or greed hmm. and then he might have to downgrade himself a little bit in terms of attainments or maybe somebody says something unwelcome or something rude and where he then feels oh some annoyance or some dislike or even anger coming up and then also uh, he might understand that he overestimated himself so this has happened to actually, I think, quite a number of practitioners. And sometimes it might be difficult to avoid, but then you just have to adjust your assessment. And ideally, probably, it's best not to jump to conclusions too quickly. Just keep practicing. Even if you think uh, you've attained something special, just keep practicing what else to do. And then time will show whether uh, it's a solid attainment or it was just a good period. But now we come to the price question. Is it possible not just to overestimate one's attainments, but is it also possible to underestimate one's attainments? Well, I would say it depends. It depends especially on one's familiarity with the Buddha's teachings due to uh, exposure to the Dhamma. If one is very familiar with the Dhamma, and then after a long period of practice, eventually reaches stream entry, one will certainly understand what has just happened and is able to put the label stream entry on it correctly. Now, particularly if a person is familiar with the 10 fetters, among which the first three are gone and also the, the virtue is completely transformed. And so these are important factors for such evaluation. And so then he can clearly understand that uh, no, no way that he wouldn't know about that. But then there's also a possibility that a person um, would, who is rather new to the Dhamma, who maybe just hears a Dhamma talk from the Buddha or maybe on YouTube uh, for the first time. And it was not uncommon at the time that the person, while listening to the Dhamma for the first time, would become a stream enterer. Uh, so that person has understood some core teachings of the Buddha, like the principle of conditionality or non-self. But not necessarily that he understands all aspects of the Buddha's teachings. And the stages of, uh, of the Aryas and the Ten Fetters, he might not even have encountered that so far. So a person who is so new to the Dhamma, yet attains stream entry, would not have the label and the framework to understand what has happened to him. You might just say, well, actually, you feel very good, or something has changed, it feels very positive, a new worldview. But 
we wouldn't know that this signifies stream entry. It's not like you're playing a video game where you go to the first level and then a bar or a banner comes up and it flashes, you know, uh, second level, <laughs> I get a 5,000 bonus points. Uh, not like that. The mind is not like this. So you have an experience, but then you don't get a stream enter, sotapanna level flashing, sakadagami, anagami, first jhana, second jhana. <laughs> so you have an experience, but then you still need to evaluate that experience through the lens of the Buddhist teachings. And only then, uh, hopefully, a correct assessment of the Dhamma can uh, follow. And correct assessment of one's uh, experience and attainment. So yes, it is possible also to either overestimate, but also to underestimate one's own attainment. So I think we should we will soon come back to this point when we now take a final look at the initial question that we started out with, which was, is stream entry still possible? And if yes, why are there so few of them these days? Right? So if we look again and have a see, have a look at what are the possible reasons for a lack of sotopanas these days, uh, we identified that some say that human beings are not of the same quality as they used to be. But then as we discuss this matter, uh, I would tentatively conclude that it's not so obvious that humans nowadays are lacking any faculties or that our environment is so much less ideal for awakening than the period of ancient India. In some respects, it's even better suited than, than ever before. So the first one uh, doesn't seem to be a particularly uh, convincing point to me. The second aspect, uh, that of incorrect practice. So here uh, I would conclude as well that I would agree here that even nowadays, if we use the early teachings of the Buddha as our guide, uh, then we are ensured to practice correctly and various stages of awakening become accessible. Mm. So that is certainly a possibility. Even though it depends now, if one is not following the Buddha's teachings, uh, then that can be, uh, I fully agree, a reason for not attainment of stream entry. If a person just practices samatha alone, never any vipassana, and believes that just by repeating a mantra or the word of the Buddha or something and doing just that all the time, uh, that that is sufficient, uh, then that might uh, be an obstacle. So it depends. But if your practice is rooted in the teachings of the Buddha, uh, then these teachings are still available and actually very consistent, which we know from comparative study and very reliable, especially the suttas, the early discourses, and more than enough, even in English translation, to lead to awakening. And then the third point was that there's a probability or a certain chance of overestimation of what it means to be a stream enderer and what are the preconditions for its attainments, right? So in this category, we first discussed uh, what is the literal meaning of the term Sotapanna, uh, one who enters the stream of Dhamma and is thereby carried forward toward Nibbana. So this was how we started out, but then also we discussed about what's the level of virtue that a Sotapanna possesses. And I concluded that in the five precepts, uh, he's meticulous and she makes no mistakes and uh, does not put the precepts aside on Monday and keeps him only five days a week or six days a week. So the five precepts are unbroken, undefiled, but there can be uh, minor transgressions in other areas. But these won't result in a bad rebirth 
for that person uh, because of the cultivation of his or her spiritual qualities. Remember, the lump of salt simile, so that dilutes the effects of the unwholesome actions. So therefore, even those smaller unwholesome actions that a steam enterer can engage, maybe occasionally falls into idle chatter, or wrong word, a little bit harsh or impatient speech, uh -huh. that is not capable enough of producing a bad rebirth. And the result will be in the present life and will be rather trifling in comparison. Then we discussed uh, what is the level of concentration that the Sotapanna possesses, uh, are jhanas necessary or not. And here we concluded, at least from the perspective of the suttas, that jhanas are necessary only for anagami and arahanship. But believing that a Sotapanna needs jhana for his attainment, but then not having it because it's not so easy to attain, that can also easily lead to underestimation of one's own abilities or attainments. Can a Sotapanna get greedy or angry? How would you answer now? Yes, because he has abandoned only the first three fetters, not number four and five. Can a Sotapanna still take things personally, as if they were a self? Yes, because despite of right view, and having overcome personality view, Sakayatiti, he still has identification, mana, and distortions of perception, Sanya Vipalasa. So spontaneously, the Sotapanna may still identify with things, or take things personally. But whenever he's reminded or reminds himself and thinks things through, immediately he understands there is no self, but only spontaneous perception level uh, that can take, his right view can take up to seven lifetimes until it penetrates his whole being and even his spontaneous reactions in all forms of and situations of life. Then what are the qualities of a Sotapanna according to the discourses? Well, confirmed faith in the Buddha and the Dhamma and Sangha. Also, such a person will never seek out another teacher outside of the Buddha's dispensation. Also, uh, his perfection in the virtue that is dear to the noble ones, which we identified refers to the five precepts. Also, uh, there's an assurance to attain Nibbana within seven lifetimes, or less, of course. And there will be no rebirth in the lower planes of existence, lower than the human plane. Also, there's a natural generosity uh, in that person. It's also one of the qualities of a Sotapanna. And such a person can practice independently and is self-sufficient. Yet he can probably still speed things up uh, with the help and support of a good teacher. But even if not encountering a capable teacher, uh, he can still progress and reach the goal on his own. This is what it means, actually, to be on the path, to move forward and eventually reach the destination. Has a Sotapanna seen or experienced Nibbana? Well, from the suttas that we discussed, it seems, no, only an Arahant has directly experienced Nibbana, um, meaning he has directly experienced the destruction of the Danes, of the Kilesas, and the attainment of the deathless. So this direct experience of there being no more rebirth, he directly understands that. But uh, no such thing is mentioned for stream enterers. And even for the other hand, it's not actually an experience of the Nibbana Tatu uh, like that, uh, but more in, in terms of the destruction of the Danes. That's what he experiences. And that remains for the other hand throughout his whole life. This is the beauty of it, you know. You don't have to restrain yourself anymore and practice not to indulge in sense pleasures or not to get angry or annoyed, but it's the nature. These defilements have been uprooted. It's, it's so deeply ingrained. You don't have to restrain yourself. 
It's, it's just the second nature or first nature in this case. Yeah. Is it possible to overestimate one's attainments? Yes, can happen easily, especially with good samadhi. Is it possible to underestimate one's attainments? Yes, can happen easily with lack of Dhamma knowledge or misunderstandings about the qualities of his dream enterer. So one can easily underestimate one's own attainments and even long-term Tama practitioners because they have a certain idea or ideal of stream entry which does not match on to what the Buddha explained about the qualities of a stream enterer. So they may wait for a long time until they realize uh, they have attained it. But even in this case, you know, there's no harm because as long as the person has not reached arahanship, you're supposed to keep practicing anyway. So whether you're now a stream enterer or not, really it shouldn't make much difference because you would still be, it would still be required to continue practicing with earnesty, sincerity and effort. Some people say, well, if you know I'm a stream enterer, then, then I can take it a bit easy, huh? relax. Uh, Seven more lifetimes, not so bad, you can enjoy a little bit. Huh? <laughs> but then, you know, there was even at the Buddha's time, there was a stream enterer who had this kind of contemplation. And then the Buddha was reading his mind and appeared straight in front of him and admonished him and said, just as a little bit of feces of excrement stinks and is uh, repulsive, in the same way, even a little bit of becoming, of existence, of power is repulsive. So you should not be happy having just seven more lifetimes. You should try to get out of samsara as soon as possible. Now that's what the Buddha was telling the Sotapanna who became a bit complacent and reflected about uh, taking a little bit of a break now. <laughs> So the simile is quite interesting, even like a little bit of feces is repulsive. Likewise, even short existence is still uh, to be feared and to be uh, escaped from, according to the Buddha. So, final conclusion. Uh, prior to the 19th century, there was a common belief in Sri Lanka and also other Theravada countries that nowadays it's not possible anymore attain any bars and fruits. And the monks focused mainly on Tama studies and making married themselves in order to go to heaven and be reborn at the time maybe of the next Buddha of Maitreya. But then there came a shift in perception due to the arising and influence of the Burmese meditation schools, especially in the 19th and 20th century and particularly the traditional of Mahasi. And where Maha meditation centers were established and people were coming out and having good experiences and some of them even claimed to have entered the stream. And around the same period of time, also in Thailand, uh, some monks went back to the roots, quite literally, they were living in the forest and starting to meditate again and which the forest tradition had died out. There was no forest tradition at that time. So some monks started with that again and said, maybe it is possible to attain something and started to practice. And out of that came this uh, Arjun Man lineage, where then later his disciples themselves became important teachers like Nongta Mahapur, Arjun Cha, and so on. And who also have supposedly uh, achieved stages of awakening. So both in Burma as well as in Thailand, almost at the same time, there was a revival of, uh, of the practice and a kind of motivation spread throughout the area where people said, oh, we can still practice and it's still possible to attain things. And even lay people were starting to go on retreats because the Burmese tradition had this setup came up with the setup of getting people for shorter retreats and can also progress on the path and 
supposedly even entered the stream. So that was leading to revival of meditation and Dhamma practice. And even nowadays, uh, according to contemporary reports from monks and laity, uh, we still see them to be fully capable of achieving all four stages uh, of Aryanhood, uh, even in our, in our current time and age. So in short, the Dhamma is still available, and despite of its occasional alterations, which is to be expected after 2,600 years, it is still capable to lead to the four noble stages of awakening. Since the Dharma is still available and we have gained the human condition, we are all human beings, and therefore it's our duty to make good use of this precious opportunity. I leave you with this encouragement, and if there's still some time left, I would like to invite maybe for a few questions, if there are any, uh, or otherwise we can also close it off straight away. Uh, over to, to the MC, Bobby. Thank you, Bante, for your encouragement and for highlighting that it's uh, still possible that same stream entry. Bante, there are about six questions here. Uh, can I offer them, Bante? Okay, first question. Okay. Bante, so what are the foundations and basis of the commentaries? Were they written by Aryans or scholar monks or mere academics? I think it's a mixed mixed bag because uh, some of the commentaries have arisen already very early in the Buddha's dispensation. And there's evidence that even during the Buddha's lifetime or soon afterwards, that there were already texts handed down alongside with the suttas that offered explanations about the suttas. And these commentaries had the function of providing some background information. Uh, for example, uh, Often the Sutta itself would just give you, okay, the Buddha has a conversation and then maybe admonishes a monk about something and gives him a certain teaching. But sometimes you don't know why did the Buddha speak with him about this topic? So the commentaries would then explain, oh, they had a, an exchange last a week earlier and that person has this background and it would give some background about how this conversation started. And that often helps us to understand uh, why the Buddha reacted, for example, in certain ways. Maybe sometimes even a bit stern or strict, but if we don't see the background, and we don't know the background story, it would seem a bit strange. But when we do, through the help of the commentaries, then we can make sense of it. So this is the function of the commentary to provide some background information and also to elaborate on difficult Dhamma terms that uh, if, uh, even now we've been reading the suttas, there are some terms that are actually quite uh, deep and meaningful and where it's helpful if you can have a second opinion. So the commentaries would often elaborate on some of these doctrinal terms. So that sense also can be helpful. But as you ask, uh, who is the source for that? Uh, they were written by whom? So this was mainly by eminent uh, teachers and scholars, learned monks, uh, partly also by practitioners. Even the Visuddhimagga, it's not a commentary by definition, but yeah, uh, it's a work on its own right. But in terms of style, it fits. Even the Visuddhimagga, uh, we can clearly see that practitioners were uh, inputting information for that compendium. It's clearly based also on personal experiences, not only scholarship. Uh, when you look through the descriptions of the jhanas, samatha practices, it's very clear that there was a deep understanding of the mind and uh, of the workings of the mind. Yet, of course, they were not all Aryas or even Arahans. So uh, we have to take it with a grain of salt and the Buddha explained that whoever says something, even a very learned monk, or even a, a whole group of monks, a whole Sangha who say, oh, this is the teaching of the Buddha, 
We should listen carefully, remember it, and then compare it with the suttas and the Vinaya, as he was teaching them. So, if the teaching is in line with what the Buddha says, we can accept it as the word of the Buddha. But if it's contradictory or it does not match, uh, then we should put it aside and conclude uh, this is, has been misunderstood by this dear venerable one. So this is called the Four Great Standards. You can read about this principle in Anguttara Nikaya 4.180. It's called the Mahabhadisa Sutta, the Four Great References. Anguttara 4.180. So it's a very important principle. So, long story short, uh, yes, the commentators were learned monks, um, probably more learned than any one of us here, uh, even in combination. Many of them could memorize the whole uh, Sutta Pitaka, Vinaya Pitaka, even the Abhidhamma Pitaka at that time. So definitely we should definitely. take them seriously, but also with a grain of salt and not uh, blindly accept everything. Still need to be compared with the Buddha's words. Okay? Yeah, thank you, Bhante. Bhante, is practicing meditation a must for one to attain Sotapan? Well, now you have listened to the Stama talk. <laughs> now you should know. <laughs> so, about all the qualities of the stream mantra that we have discussed now. How, how often was meditation mentioned? Or the level of samadhi? Or vipassana? Doesn't seem to be very prominent, right? Doesn't seem to feature much. It's actually mainly on a view level that the stream mantra has, that a big shift has been made for him. He understands that there is no self, uh, there is the, just the five aggregates. He has right view about cause and effect. Things are conditioned. They are not created by God. And he does not believe in eternalism because he knows that things are conditioned. You see, all these things are actually perspectives, views. Not much for the stream enter is yet mentioned in terms of um, deep meditative experience. But we see only this coming in then a bit later, especially then with the Anagami and Arahant, where we see also their accomplishment in Samadhi. And whereas dependent origination, the principle of dependent origination is something that the stream enterer already understands. But it doesn't mean necessarily the 12 links uh, in the systematic way, but it's more about the principles, the general principle of which the 12 links are just one uh, manifestation. Uh, I will keep it at that. Thank you, Bhante. Bhante, how does normal Putujana practice Yata, Buddha, Nana, Dasana, seeing things as they really are? Mm. So, seeing things as they are or as they have come to be uh, refers to the practice of discerning uh, experience, whatever you can observe, through the lens of anicca, dukkha, anatta, and conditionality. So, if you have a feeling, you feel a bit uh, hot on the skin, and you know then you observe that, that sensation, the temperature on the skin, and you see also it changes a little bit. Sometimes it gets a bit cooler, sometimes a bit warmer. And so you can see change happening there. So at that time, you already see things according to reality. You see things as impermanent, as changing. And or in daily life, when you somebody offers you your favorite meal, and you might experience the taste of that, but then afterwards you contemplate, actually it doesn't give me a long satisfaction. Um, my happiness now is quite the same as before the meal. And so you can contemplate uh, about the drawbacks, about the disadvantages of sense pleasures. 
and about their unsatisfactory nature. So during such contemplation, you also practice yatha putanyana dasana, seeing things as they truly are in terms of unsatisfactoriness. So anicca, dukkha, anatta. So, and the condition for that in the suttas is always mentioned, the mind that is concentrated sees things as they truly are. Because even if you try to contemplate, if the mind is too scattered, it's also difficult. So you need at least some, I'm not saying perfect samadhi, of course, that would be ideal, uh, but it, it's helpful to have some degree of samadhi that the mind is stable enough to observe phenomena in your senses, or on the breath. It can be a contemplative practice, but it can also be direct experience of what is happening right now. Sights, sounds, odors, flavors, they all have the characteristic of anicca, dukkha, anatta, even mind objects. So, whenever you see things through the lens of impermanence, anti-dissatisfactoriness, non-self, or conditionality, at that time you see things as they have come to be, according to reality. Thank you, Bhante. Bhante, if one only becomes enters the Noble Eightfold Path after becoming a stream enterer, what is the role of the Noble Eightfold Path for becoming a stream enterer? That's a good question. Because um, for those who very quickly attain stream entry, we cannot see much of a prior practice. And in the discourses, Often people listen to the Dhamma and then the Dhamma Chakku arises in them and they become stream enterers. So you don't see any prior practices of becoming stream enterers. But looking at, at the 10 fetters that, and the first three that the stream enterer has overcome, if you want to focus on something, or if you would ask me what is the most important thing for the stream enterer to develop, well, it obviously has to do a lot with right view, right understanding, uh, understanding the Buddhist teachings, and also working on one's virtue, uh, being very committed to uphold the five precepts. Uh, also, the other forms of wrong speech, of course, and wrong action, but especially the five precepts. And if you combine these types of practice, and then also you sprinkle in uh, some Samatha and Vipassana, I think there is a good chance that over time you get closer and closer to stream entry and even in this very life uh, would, might be able to attain. But particularly, as, you, as, as I've said, it's particularly the understanding, the perspectives, the views that you have to work on, or maybe not you specifically, but Often, this is a main obstacle uh, that somebody still has some eternalist view or does not accept the law of karma or how, how do you feel about rebirth. Uh, if there's still a kind of denial of, of rebirth or of law of cause and effect, uh, then uh, it would not qualify as a right view. Even something like agnosticism, where you keep it open, Okay, I don't know from personal experience, you might say, whether they have past lives, future lives, different planes of existence. But for a stream enterer, he, even if he does not know it from personal experience, he would take it then at least on trust from the teacher, from the Buddha. So even things, because this is one of the qualities of a stream enterer, uh, uh, fast trust and faith in Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha. So he gives the benefit of the doubt about those teachings that he has not yet personally verified. And then eventually you can verify more and more of them. And then uh, your initial trust and faith will be substituted with personal experience. But from the past to stream entry, uh, there's something that's called a Dhamma, uh, uh, Sata Nusari, uh, somebody who has 
Sata faith as his predominant factor for stream entry. And the faith is the driving force that the, the inspiration from the Buddha and the, maybe the teachings also uh, is the driving force that interests him in the Dhamma. And so for such a person, uh, that is actually enough to get right view. Oh, he has heard it from the Buddha, uh, thought about it, reflected it, uh, tested it, and makes sense, and he already accepts it. Whereas uh, Panya Anusari uh, needs to approach more through his own wisdom faculty, finds it maybe more difficult to take things on trust, and would have to rely more on personal experience. Both pathways can lead to stream entry, but probably the easier one uh, could be the faith-based one. It depends actually on your personality, because for somebody who does not have a uh, disposition towards faith, actually the wisdom one is the easier one. So it depends. Thank you, Bhante. on the five hindrances, the uh, how do they see the path if the view of perception is not cleansed of five hindrances through jhana? To be more specific, is it possible to suppress the five nivaranas without jhanic experience? Uh, at least at the time of stream entry, uh, the five hindrances uh, cannot be present. So it doesn't mean you have already to be the last year before stream entry, never ever the five hindrances can come up. That would be a very high bar and very unrealistic. But again, let us go back to this very classic example. Somebody seeing the Buddha for the first time, hearing the Dhamma from him. At that time, the people are not thinking about eating, drinking, uh, sensual experience. No, they're giving full attention to the teachings of the Buddha, to the Dhamma. And when the Buddha sees that their mind is free from the hindrances, free from obstacles, then and only then he gives them the teachings that are special, that are special only to Buddhas. Only then he explains to them the Four Noble Truths. And then often as a result, because the mind is ready and is not overcome by the hindrances because you're hearing the Dhamma, you're listening to the Dhamma. Uh, at that time, the Dhamma Chaku arises and the person often understands whatever is of the nature to arising will also cease. So you might not have to practice weeks, months or years of jhana in order to suppress the hindrances. It can be done in this way, very good, but it can also be very quick and very spontaneous because the five hindrances uh, can also be uh, temporarily abandoned by Dhamma activities, like listening to Dhamma, reciting the Dhamma, um, walking in meditation, sitting meditation, loving kindness, so many ways of overcoming, but not only through meditation, also by contemplating about the Dhamma on that occasion to one sutta explains um, that the occasion, the five hindrances are abandoned or suppressed, if you want. Okay. Thank you, Bhante. Bhante, can a monk declare that he is an arahant to an assembly of lay people, yogis? Uh, no. So even if a monk is an arahant, uh, uh, we have a winner rule, a monk's rule, not to declare that publicly or not even privately to other, only towards other monastics, uh, to other monks, uh, he could declare it. But even then, actually we are quite uh, circumspect and maybe to close disciples or to his own teacher, he would open it up at the right time. Uh, but it's not considered like good manners somehow to show off or to to make it so open. Uh, but it's not a winning offense. Among the Sangha, it's completely okay. And uh, there is also a tradition, actually, when a monk gets old and just before he passes away, uh, it's a tradition that the other monks will ask him at that time, uh, whenever one, 
Is there any uh, attainments that you may have attained and achieved throughout your lifetime? And because if the answer is yes, then uh, such a person is worthy of a tupa, of a stupa to be built in his memory. If he's an arahant or at least an arya, uh, then um, his remains, his, his ashes after the funeral uh, would be worthy of being put into a tupa. So in the old days, they wouldn't make a tupa just for everyone, but for those who are highly attained, uh, such a person would be worth it. So that's why the monks ask him uh, before he's passing away, which indicates that they did not ask him beforehand and that it's not that they didn't speak about it all the time very openly. Otherwise, they wouldn't have to ask him in the last moment. So there's a little bit of holding back, but then also an openness between friends or close associates, co-practitioners, monks among themselves. Ah, yes, sometimes we do share these things, uh, but certainly we want to keep it low profile. And especially once the lady finds out about it, uh, so easy to become famous, popular, uh, donations. So it can be a really bad incentive for spreading, uh, for spreading this kind of information. So yes, not allowed sharing with lay people. It's a vineyard offense. Uh, it can be confessed. It's not the Parajika offense. Parajika would be only if you know you're not a monk, but then you claim to be a monk. Uh, sorry, if you know you're not attained, but you claim to be attained, uh, that would be very serious. That other offense of making it open towards lay people, we call is a pachitya offense. So it has to be confessed to another monk and then should not do it again in the future. Okay, okay. that's the last question for the day. Thank you, Bhante. Can Bhante uh, share the merits? <laughs> okay, that, that's the question. Uh, let me think it's a difficult question. Uh, yeah, I think we can do that. Um, so just to summarize, maybe before that, uh, I hope also that uh, this talk may have aroused maybe a sense of possibility and maybe a newly found confidence in some of you that stream entry is maybe closer to your heart than you would have expected. If this possibility gets coupled with a dedication towards the study and practice of the Dhamma, then I see a good chance that some of you may attain stream entry and maybe even higher in this very life. So let us close the afternoon and evening with a sharing of merit where we can invite our departed relatives and friends to rejoice in the good deeds and the wholesome actions that we have accumulated throughout the day. You can take a moment to reflect and think back about some of the deeds that you have done, wholesome actions, Maybe helping someone or preparing food for lunch. Or maybe it's just a small thing like opening the door for someone. Also, we've listened to the Tamma, which is very wholesome. So let us re-invite our departed relatives, friends, and all beings to rejoice in this merit. Please repeat after me. Itang me nyatinang hotu 
Sukita Hontunya Tayo Itang no Nyatinang Hotu Sukita Hontunya Tayo Itang Vo Nyatinang Hotu Sukita Hontunya Tayo Etta Bata Jaam Hehe Sampadang Punya Sampadang Sapi Satta Anumo Dandu Pasampati Siddhya And lastly, let us also make an aspiration so that the good karma that we have accumulated will also support us on our own path to liberation, on our own path to Nibbana. Please repeat after me. Idang me punyang Asavakkaya Bahang Hotu Idang me punyang Nipanasa Bajayo Hotu Sadhu 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 Thank you, Bante, and uh, thank you everyone for coming in. And uh, hopefully, this will inspire all of us to attain stream entry, to strive for stream entry. Thank you again.